it's Jesus or Muhammad. And yes, I'm not Sam Shimon, uh, not even half a Sam Shimon. Yeah, who, who, who are you? <laughs> who are you? I, I, I am merely a plain warner. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Jesus or Muhammad, I tell you what, I'm honored to be here. Certainly, I can't fill the shoes of Sam Shimon, but I thank God I have the same spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and I have the same co-host, Brother David Wood. Praise God for you, David. How's it going? I'm all right. Hey, we got a great show tonight. You know, I just got to say, tonight's show, we're talking about Shabir Ali and, uh, you know, him talking about, well, hey, you know, uh, Allah's word can't be corrupted when it comes to the Quran. But, of course, the Bible in previous revelations can be corrupted. And we're going to see some clips here in just a, a moment that Shabir puts forth his argument. And, you know, I know Shabir Ali is supposed to be hot stuff. But listen, Muslims, Shabir, whoever, hey, if you're going to bring these kind of arguments we're going to see in this show, hey, even Pastor Joseph will debate you, okay? Give me a call, 248-416-1300. Brother David, would you like to kind of set the stage before we show this first clip? Well, um... Muslims have speakers who are popular, and they have speakers that are uh, more popular than Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali is very popular, but, yeah. but someone like Zakir Naik would be uh, even more popular, and that's from a Muslim perspective. Right. Um, from a Christian perspective, we would look at someone like Jacques, Zakir Naik and think, wow, this guy's a total joke. Yeah. I mean, his arguments are that bad. Right. I, we can't even take his claims seriously. More rhetoric than yeah. anything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. With Shabir, Shabir is in a, in a different class because he actually studies New Testament uh, textual criticism. He studies right. new t the, the history uh, uh, of uh, historical Jesus studies and so on. So he's arguing at a different level than yes. someone like Zakir Naik or, or Ahmed Didat. Gotcha. And so we would ha his arguments, I don't think, are, are much better. Right. But because he's, he's quoting various Christian scholars and sure. so on, uh, it, could be, it can be more persuasive to someone who's intellectually minded and not just rhetorically minded. So that's the person we're responding to, but the arguments in general are things that are, that are of concern to all Muslims and all Christians uh, dealing with the preservation of the Quran and the Bible. And uh, the two main issues that we'll, we'll be looking at tonight are, one, that Muslims believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, right mm -hmm. down to the letter. Yeah. And that's absolute nonsense. <laughs> I won't even go, we won't even go to various manuscripts. We won't go to any of that. We'll go to your sources. Right. We'll pull open Bukhari and Sahih right. Muslim and Sunan Abu Dawud. We'll, we'll quote your most trusted sources. We'll quote Muhammad's companions and show you that is absolute nonsense. And if Muhammad's companions didn't believe the Quran was perfectly preserved, if they understood that it went through all kinds of changes, what business does a Muslim today, 14 centuries later, have saying, all of Muhammad's companions were wrong? And I'm right. I know more about what, what, what the, what the, how the Quran was compiled. So that's one issue. And the other is Muslims believe that the Bible yeah. has been corrupted. Unlike the Quran, the Bible has been corrupted. And here again, we'll quote your own sources, right? We won't go to the textual criticism. We won't go to various scholars. We'll go to your own sources to show you, well, that it can't be corrupted. Now, we don't believe in your sources. We don't believe in the Muslim sources. So it would never occur to us to say, uh, well, the Muslim sources say it's, 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 it's reli the, the Christian yeah. scriptures are reliable, therefore right. they're reliable. We don't believe that. But we want to point out this horrible, horrible problem yeah. in Islam, namely that your sources, as we'll see tonight, your sources, Muslims, affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our scriptures, and yet your sources contradict our scriptures. So what are you going to do? Well, what Muslims like Shabir Ali tend to do is pretend that the Quran doesn't say all that stuff about the Bible. Pretend, well, according to the Quran, the Bible's been corrupted. Right. We're going to show that's absolute nonsense, and we're going to leave you with a very significant problem tonight, Muslims. Either way you go, hmm. Islam is false. Yes. If our book has been corrupted, as Shabir Ali will claim, then Islam is false because Islam says our book hasn't been corrupted. On the other hand, if our book hasn't been corrupted, as your sources claim, then Islam is false. Your religion is false because your religion contradicts what we read in the Bible. So either way, if the Bible has been preserved or it hasn't been preserved, either way, Islam is false. That's what we're going to leave you with tonight. Perhaps it could be summed up very briefly this way. Uh, if you are a good Muslim, a good Muslim, and you believe all of your most authentic sources, then you must doubt the authenticity and the preservation of the Quran. Uh, and if, of course, you don't, uh, doubt and you just accept it wholesale, you're a bad Muslim. <laughs> and of course, this leaves you with the dilemma David has pointed out. And, and essentially, Islam is self-defeating. 
Yeah, it, yeah, it, it, it requires Muslims to believe a contradiction. Anything that requires you to believe an explicit, clear contradiction, that cannot be true. The and proof so, of so, the whole so, yes. faith and the preservation of this book is based in, an, in a philosophical contradiction, a real yeah. contradiction. Yeah, so Islam requires Muslims. If they, think, if, they, if they actually understand what their book says, and if they actually understand what our book says, yeah. then they'd understand their religion requires them to believe that our scriptures have not been corrupted right. and that they have been corrupted. You have to believe both yes. as a Muslim. You have to believe the Bible, this book right here. You have to believe this is not the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. And you have to believe that it is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. That's a contradiction. And there's no way around it other than ignoring what your book actually teaches. I'd go further than that. I believe, and David, you'll show us, and, and I won't delay us any more than this, just to say I believe that if you take the authentic Islamic sources, the earliest Islamic sources, you will find more proof for the preservation and the authority of this book, of course the Quran itself, uh, than you will uh, proof for the, the, the authority of the Quran. In other words, there's more evidence in the, in the Hadith, in the, even in the Quran, and certainly in the Syria literature, against the authority of the Quran than there is against the authority of the Bible. Oh, yeah. There's, you know, yeah and we're going to see, see that. We've got some problems here. Right now. Mm -hmm. So shall we go to the clip? Yeah, let's go to our first clip. All right, technicians, if you would, let's roll that first clip, Shabir Ali, uh, on the preservation in this first clip on Someone's the Quran. Someone's asking him a question. Yeah, yeah well, he's, he's got a question. He's going to answer first. We're going to look at the Quran, and then we're going to go into the preservation of the Bible. Let's roll this first clip right now. Uh, Imam Shabir, you know, an interesting question is this, that if Muslims uh, claim that the uh, Bible was a revelation of God, uh, then the obvious question comes in, why did uh, God allow it to be changed? Uh, and why not the Quran? I mean, this question is often uh, we are hit, you know, uh, with uh, by the non-Muslims. Yes. Well, uh, there's the question. And would you rephrase it? Because, of course, he is speaking Pakistani English. So oh, he's <laughs> maybe, fine. He's fine. Maybe so. I kind of like the why Islam guys. Yeah. They're, they're, at least, they're at least trying to, uh, to... They try to dress Western and try to... No, you not know. that. They're, they're, try, they're <laughs> trying to actually answer, uh, answer some questions. Yeah. And they're bringing in people like Shabir Ali. Now, right. now our, 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 hope, our hope is that uh, people will sit back and realize, wait a minute, we have people who are trying to get answers. They're yeah. bringing in some of Islam's best apologists to get answers. Right. And their answers are horrible. Yeah. What's that mean? Yeah. It's one thing if, you know, some random Muslim <coughs> off the street can't give a good answer or right. his answer is totally wrong, right? Because a Christian could do the same thing. You can, have a, you can find a Christian who gives a totally wrong, nonsensical answer. But when they bring the best But when the best. they bring the best they've got yeah. and the answers are totally wrong in every <laughs> possible way, any person who seeks the truth should start to wonder, why is this? Why is it that our best guys <coughs> not get their facts and right? And praise God, they're wondering all over the earth, and you need to give to ABN, give to David Wood's ministry, Sam Shimon's ministry, because they are questioning around the earth. And praise God, they're coming to Christ through this program, Jesus or Muhammad, mm -hmm. you and Sam. Yeah, we, we hear uh, m most, of the, most of the time we don't, we don't bring out the messages because m most people don't want to, uh, yeah. don't want to be public, and, and right. rightly so. Uh, but we hear from people all the time. All hear, over the world. Yeah, yeah, we hear from Muslims who have left Islam and become Christians. We, we also hear from Muslims who have left Islam and haven't become Christians, right? They said, hey, you know, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I'm not a Christian, but, uh, on, no. but you know, I, I don't believe in Islam anymore. And also important, we hear from lots of people who say, um, man, I was thinking about considering Islam. In I was Christian. thinking about converting to Islam, and I was starting <coughs> to doubt Christianity. I thank, I thank, I, I thank you guys and your show for, for dealing with those doubts and for, for responding to the claims about Islam. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we, we hear those sorts of things. Um, all the time. But th think about the question here. Okay. Why hasn't Allah preserved the previous scriptures? And that's and, a and, big and, assumption, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So but unlike the Quran, which he has preserved perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. So notice what's going into, that, going into the question even. Yeah. We're assuming from the beginning the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Right. So why perfectly preserve the Quran? Shabir yeah. Ali is going to respond to that. Yeah. And, we'll, and we'll discuss whether his claim is <coughs> accurate. And next... Well, if Allah is powerful enough to preserve his Quran, if he was able to preserve this book, he has that power. No one can corrupt it. No one can come in there and change his book. He is completely capable of protecting his book from corruption. Why didn't he do that with all the other scriptures? Because the right. Quran claims over and over again that Allah sent prior prophets and Allah sent prior scriptures, and yet Muslims want to tell us, oh, they've, they've, their messages and their, and, their, and their books were all corrupted. 
And so, sort of so what happened? So what happened? Allah's that Allah's powerful enough to protect it, and yet He doesn't. Why? Why on earth? So it's a good question if you're Muslim, right? It is a good question. Mm -hmm. Shall we, are we going to move on with the? Yeah, case? let's let us let us let us get Shabir's uh, uh, response with our next video. Let's go to that right now. Let's start with the Quran. Why not allow the Quran's message to be changed? The reason is that God revealed the Quran as the final revelation. That has to remain with human beings until the day of judgment. So we have to have that confidence. We're going here to this book and we're finding the word of God and nothing else. So the Quran has to be preserved. That's the logic behind this. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you, you heard the logic be behind this, right? Yeah. So notice, notice the, kind of, the kind of circular reasoning here, right? <laughs> Um, it's preserved because it has to be. <laughs> yeah, because Islam is true. I see. Yeah, and it's the final so, so, revelation. Yeah, so, 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 how do you know Islam is true? How do you know Islam is true? Well, why, why well, well because we have, the, we have the preserved message of God. Well, how do you know it's been preserved? Because Islam is true, and obviously God wants to preserve and, His and true because message. And it's the final. Yeah. Uh huh. The Mormons aren't. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So we'll just lay that down as a rule. <laughs> Islam. Is <laughs> Interesting stuff, right? Uh, but we're going to lay that aside. We're going to lay that aside. <coughs> Want to be clear here, the Quran does seem to claim that Allah will preserve his message. And Muslims mm -hmm. uh, base this on a passage of scripture. I'll go ahead and read it. This is Surah 15, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Allah speaking says, We have without doubt sent down the message, and we will assuredly guard it from corruption. Mm -hmm. So Allah is promising his followers that he's going to preserve the message. Right. And if you talk to Muslims... Almost any Muslim you run into will tell you the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Let me read you uh, a standard kind of claim, just so you, you, those of you who aren't, if this is new to you, I don't want you to think I'm making things up. Uh, this is from a Muslim apologist named Mazhar Kazi. He says, Muslims and non-Muslims both agree that no change has ever occurred in the text of the Quran. It is a miracle of the Quran that no change has occurred in a single word, a single letter of the alphabet, a single punctuation mark, or a single diacritical mark in the text of the Quran during the last 14th century. <laughs> there was no diacritical marks at all of the original text. Yeah, well, yeah, this is just, this is just nonsense, but... But so notice, notice, how, notice, how the reasoning, the, notice how the reasoning actually works. The Quran says Allah will preserve it, Therefore, he must have preserved it. Therefore, it's been perfectly preserved. Absolutely. And what's the problem? <laughs> well, the problem is there's this thing called reality. There's yeah. this thing called history. Yeah. There's this thing called your Muslim texts, which talk about the history of your book. <coughs> and they don't, they, don't, they don't present the same picture. They tell a very, very different story. So let me tell you, Muslims out there and Christians who are watching and anyone else who's watching, uh, let's go through a brief history of the Quran because it's very, very interesting and totally, totally different from anything you'll hear from any Muslim. Uh, so just basic background information. The first Quranic revelation supposedly came to Muhammad in the year 610. So he's in his cave. You're familiar with this story most likely. Um, so 610, Muhammad's about 40 years old. He receives his first revelation. And for the next 22, 23 years, somewhere in there, he continues receiving revelations from God through the angel Gabriel. And the, some of those revelations were collected into the Quran and then put out as what we have here. Right. Only problem is it's not what we have here. Right. It's actually, there are actually some important differences. Why would you say that? You're just an evangelical Christian trying to, you know... I'm not saying it. I'm not oh. saying it. I won't even make the claim. I okay. won't even make the claim. Right. Um, this comes from Islam's most trusted sources. So, Allah. Yeah. So, so during this time, uh, Muhammad's receiving revelations. He recites it to his followers. The emphasis is on memorizing it, is on, is on memorizing portions of it, memorizing uh, individual surahs or, or chapters or individual verses because people have different, different uh, you know, memory ability. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they write it down. Sometimes they write it down, and they would write it down on pieces of bone, on flat stones, on, <coughs> uh, on leaves of trees, and so on. Now, during this time, there was no complete copy of the Quran. There wasn't this. There wasn't this. So, why is this going to be a problem? Well, ultimately, Muhammad dies. Muhammad dies, Quranic revelation ceases, and uh, after Muhammad's death, there was, I would say, the most brilliant plan in all of history, mm. if Islam is true. Yeah. Allah had promised, remember, to preserve the Quran in Surah 15, verse 9, right? Okay. So, Allah <coughs> promises to preserve the Quran. And the emphasis had been on memorizing the Quran. Mm -hmm. 
Some they didn't even have written down. Some of the Quran they didn't even have written down. People had it memorized. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion, the first rightly guided caliph, comes up with a brilliant plan, if Islam is true. Okay. Abu Bakr says, Allah has promised that he will preserve the Quran. So what I will do is, I will take all the people who memorized the Quran, and I will send them into battle, and I'll have an invincible army. <laughs> right? That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Allah has promised he's going to preserve the Quran. I'm going to take the people who have the Quran memorized. I'm going to send them into battle. Because they are the Quran. So Allah is going to protect that army, right? Because if they get slaughtered, then the Quran will be lost. Yeah, that's right. Abu Bakr sent them into battle, and they were slaughtered. Not all of the Quran was lost because other Muslims, people like Abu Bakr, had some of it memorized, but a lot of it was lost. And you, those of you out there, no, you're making this up. You don't know what you're talking about. Let me quote to you. Ibn Abi Dawud in his, in his Kitab al-Masahif. This is the son of the great Hadith compiler, Abu Dawud. Right? His son, Ibn Abi Dawud, focused on putting together a history of the text of the Quran. <clears throat> Notice what he says. Many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. That's, uh, that was the battle. And this was a, a war between Muslims. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, Abu Bakr sends them out in the battle, uh, battle of Yamama. It says, but they were not known by those who survived them, <laughs> nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Notice, many passages of the Quran were known by the people who died there in battle. They were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down. They didn't have any writing. Nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman collected the Quran by that time, mm. nor were they found with even one person after yeah. them. Now, now <coughs> see if you can make sense of this, Pastor Joseph. People had the Quran, passages of the Quran memorized. No one had it afterwards. No one had it afterwards. Has the Quran been perfectly preserved? Absolutely not. No. And this is, this is according to, to who? Uh, this is according to who? Best Muslim scholarship, earliest Muslim sources. So this is not according to David Wood or Pastor Joseph no, or Sam Samoon or these Robert Spencer or someone like that. This these is Muslim, Muslim sources, right? Yeah. And you know, what's, you, know, you know what's amazing? Muslims look at that and say, oh, he's wrong. <laughs> Why? What ev Muslims, what evidence have you been given that the Quran has been perfectly preserved? Let me ask you. And the answer is, you've just heard that over and over again from, from your leaders. And here we go to your actual scholars, the actual people who, who put together the history of your text. And they say, what are you talking about? Of course, it's, of course it's went through all kinds of changes. And you'll say, oh, they're all wrong. Who's, who's right? Oh, our leaders. Brother our leaders. David, weren't some of the battles, earliest battles in Islam, over the very fact of differing ideas of what the Quran should say? Well, well you certainly had uh, lots of battles between uh, Muslims, and you have differences in, um, in the Quran between uh, Sunnis and Shias because yeah. Ali, Ali's Quran yeah. is, is, is a little different. But I, I'm not even going yeah. to point that out. It's, it's, it's gen they generally have the same stuff. What we're, what we're dealing so with, the they have kind of wholesale uh, corruption of the text in that entire chapters are coming up missing. So the Quran, earliest known, unlike the myth that the Gabriel was with Muhammad and, and gave it to him and he wrote it down, which is a joke, not in the Quran. So the, what, what we find is it was in the people's memories. The people were wholesale slaughtered. And so now very little of what was, quote unquote, the Quran remains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, here's what's interesting. The entire reason for compiling the Quran was what happened in battle there. The fear that it would all be lost. Abu Bakr said, mm -hmm. Abu Bakr said, I need to compile what's left before more of it is lost. <coughs> so the entire reason, that, that's what's amazing. Muslims look at this and say, you see, this is, per this is the <coughs> perfectly preserved word of Allah. Wait a minute. The only reason we have this book is because so much of it had been lost already. That was the entire reason for putting yeah. it together. And Muslims have no clue what I'm talking about when I mention any of this, despite the fact that it's in their most trusted sources. Yeah. Uh, so Abu Bakr, around 634, decides we can't lose any more of the Quran like right. we just did. Right. We have to preserve what's left so that if more Muslims die who have it memorized, we won't lose even more of it. And so he, uh, he assigns, um, he assigns Zayd ibn Thabit to, uh, to preserve what's left. And then Abu Bakr dies, and this book is passed on uh, to Umar. After Umar dies, it, it, it goes on 
and stays in the house of Hafsa, one of Muhammad's widows. And Zayd has to go find it. He doesn't have a copy, right? I mean, that's important. Yeah, he has to go. Yeah. He has to go find it. Where yeah. is the Quran? Yeah, he, Muslims he even, didn't he even know. says, if you'd asked me to move a mountain, it would have been easier, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. According to what Muslims normally believe, all these early Muslims, they all had the Quran memorized. All you need oh, to yeah. sit down is sit down with a pen, right? Here's this well, big guy. Zayd doesn't need to even go to anyone. Right? He could just sit there and, and write down the Quran from memory. According to what Muslims believe, that it's so absurd. It's so, I, I, you, you wonder, how can, any, how can you believe in reality if you're this far away from it? All right, so it goes to Hafsa. During Uthman's reign, there were disputes concerning <coughs> uh, the correct recitation of the Quran, right? They're, they're, they're reciting the Quran differently in various places. So Uthman orders that all of the written materials of the Quran, everyone who actually had something written down by them, because by now people are writing down their, their own copies of the Quran. Um, he has everyone bring in copies of the Quran, uh, everyone who has something written down. And he says, because we, you know, we want to put out an official version here. And he has Zayd ibn Thabit and another team <coughs> uh, putting together this final version, version of the Quran. And what he does, don't trust my word for it, what he does after he, he puts together his official version of the Quran. Notice, the, the, the reason for putting together the very <coughs> first Quran was that so much of it had been lost. Mm -hmm. The reason for coming up with a revised text was that there were so many differences in, way the, in the way the Quran was being recited. This is not looking good already, right? right? And we haven't right. even gotten to how you Muslims got the, the Quran <laughs> that you have today. Right. So. What did Uthman do once he had gathered together all these materials? Because in, 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 the, in the Christian history of textual criticism, we're looking for manuscripts left and right, right? Yes, and we, we want all our them. manuscripts. We preserve yeah, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have, you have Christians going around the world looking at old monasteries, looking in caves and so on, trying to get every <coughs> little fragment we can find because we want to we wanna, we wanna confirm. We want to confirm that our text has been preserved. And that is why there are new Bible translations and versions because we continually try to go for the most accurate mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. Notice how Uthman and the early Muslim community, Muhammad's companions, was different. So when it was finished, when he put together his final version, uh, this is Sahih al-Bukhari. doesn't get any stronger than this from a Muslim perspective. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 4987. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. There you go. That's the way to get one version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and anyone could do that right now, right? Here's a Bible. We could burn every other copy of the Bible in the world and say, you see here, look, the Bible's been perfectly preserved because there are no variants. King James should have done that. Yeah, <laughs> would, have been, would have been brilliant. Uh, but we would never do that because we are right. interested in the truth. Amen. Muslim, your Muslim leaders from the, from the very earliest stratum here, we're going to burn all the evidence and pretend that we didn't have these disagreements. And you have to say it worked because Muslims today, oh, there, there are no differences. We've never had any differences. Perfect preservation <coughs> down to the letter. And even after that, there's more than one Quran. Oh, of course, of course, of course. Um, e yeah, even today you can find differences in Quran yes. manuscripts. If you go to uh, the, the Sana manuscripts and so on, you mm -hmm. see, when actually, actually, I think the Sana manuscripts were actually, actually <coughs> predate Uthman's, uh, Uthman's revision. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you don't have any problem finding variations in Quranic manuscripts. In right. fact, what we know from history is that Muhammad's top scholars couldn't even agree on what was supposed to go in the Quran. Because Muhammad, Muhammad's quoting Allah left and right, and Muhammad's giving <laughs> stories left and right. Muhammad's saying things left and right, and they have a general idea of some things that are supposed to be in the Quran, but other things they're not sure. They're not sure if it's supposed to be in the Quran or not. And I'll give you an example, Surah 1 of yeah, the Quran. Yeah. Some Qurans didn't include that. Absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely correct. And there's good reason for it. Yeah. Uh, the uh, other chapters of the Quran when it's something you, you as a Muslim are going to say, it says, say. Right. It doesn't and it, say it, that. It, it doesn't say that. Right. right. It just gives it. But it's supposed <coughs> to be you saying something. So, so what are you talking about? Yeah. The reason it says, say, at the beginning of various passages where it's something you're supposed to say, is because it's supposed, uh, the entire Quran is supposed to be Allah talking. Right. And so Allah can say, say this, and then tell you something to say, and it's still him saying it, right? He's yeah. just telling you to recite what he's saying. When it doesn't include that little say, and it's just talking, yeah. but it's something you're saying, wait a minute, these are your words. These are your words, not Allah's words. Yeah. And that's, that's chapter one of the Quran. So some of Muhammad's early companions noticed this. Yes. And one, very interestingly, was Muhammad's top reciter of the Quran. Um, which one? 
Uh, Ibn Ishaq. You're, th you're thinking of Ubay ibn Kab. Ubay ibn Kab. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. was. He's. A, he's a different story. He actually has more chapters of the Quran right, than, than, right. than Muslims have. Um, but let me let me give you let me give you the names of four people. And notice the first and the last: Abdullah ibn Masud yeah. and Ubay ibn Kab. Sahih al Bukhari again. <coughs> Number 3808, Muhammad said, learn the recitation of the Quran from four. From Abdullah ibn Masud, he started with him. Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudhaifa, Muad ibn Jabal, and Ubay ibn Ka. Muhammad said, learn it from one of these. Learn it from, yeah, if you want to learn the Quran, you go to one of these guys. Okay. Now, why is that a problem? We don't have the Quran from these guys, right? <laughs> yeah. We have the Quran from Zayd ibn Thabit. Where's Zayd on this list? Yeah. Where's Zayd on this list if you want to learn the where's Quran Uthman? from Zayd? Oh, yeah, no. where's Uthman? <laughs> and what we know... We know that Ubay ibn Kab's Quran did not agree with what you have here. Right. And Ibn Masud's Quran did not agree with what you have here. According to Ibn Masud, three chapters that are in your Quran today are not supposed to be in the Quran. They're not Quranic revelation. He said these are prayers. These are our prayers. These are pray they, they're yeah. things we pray. They're not yeah. Allah's word. And so according to Ibn <coughs> Masud, Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 are not supposed to be in the Quran. But wait a minute. That's the first guy on Muhammad's list of who you should go to to learn the Quran. Well, don't you know there's seven ways that the Quran has been revealed? So shouldn't we have seven Qurans today? Uh, yeah. Es especially in well, well, yeah, and, and, and that's interesting because, uh, because that, that's a standard Muslim response. There are these seven ways. And, and there they're talking about per, you know, pronunciation differences and yeah, so on. Yeah, but there was no marks and there was no diacritical marks. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, no so, so, yeah so you could recite it in different ways. What's interesting is Muslims who say that, what did Uthman do? Yeah. He got rid of six. Yeah. What, what, who, gave, who gave Uthman authority to get rid of six of the yeah, seven versions of the Quran? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because you have to believe that happened. So has the Quran right. been changed? Wait a minute. The Quran has seven ways. Yeah. Has, there are seven According different Qurans, to Muhammad. Right? According to Muhammad. Yeah. And six of them you don't have anymore. So has the Quran been changed? Yeah. Originally you had seven different, seven different ways of, of reciting, and now you, have, now you have the one. David, there is so much devastating evidence within Islam alone to, to just abolish, destroy, demolish mm -hmm. all of the arguments of preservation of the Quran. But you know, we're going to have to take a break. Did you want to share one last thing? Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a brief outline. And when, when I post this, I'll, I'll, I'll post quotations and so on so you yeah. don't think I'm making this up. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you go to my website, answeringmuslims.com, you click on the Quran <coughs> tab, you have all of these quotations uh, in there. So Good. just go to that tab. Um, but what you have, so Ibn Masud, his Quran contains 111 chapters. Your Quran today has 114 chapters. <coughs> Ubay ibn Kaab, another person on Muhammad's list, he had 116 chapters in his Quran. He had two chapters that aren't even in your Quran today. Your scholars know this. They lie to you when they say, oh, it's, it's, it's been perfectly preserved. They know this. Anyone can know that. Anyone who's read your sources knows this, right? So even the top guys that Muhammad said, you want to learn the Quran, go from them. And those guys don't even agree among themselves. Yeah. So wh wh what do you do? Either Muhammad doesn't know how to pick people who, have the, who know the Quran, or he did know how to pe pick people who know the Quran, and this Quran today is wrong because it doesn't line up with what they said. Uthman got rid of all four of those. It's gone. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. All right, so um, basically what you'll have, and, and again, go, go, to, go to answeringmuslims.com, click on the Quran tab, and what you'll find there, very interesting, not according to me, not according to Pastor Joseph, not according to Robert Spencer or Sam Shamoon, entire chapters of the Quran have been lost. That's Sahih Muslim. That's yeah. Sahih Muslim, right. ladies and gentlemen. You Muslims know how, how, how in, in what esteem you hold Sahih Muslim. According to Abu Musa and Sahih Muslim, two entire chapters of the Quran have been lost. One of them was as long as Surah 9. That's a massive I chapter. think one was long. as long as Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2. So even they, there was a quote there as there, well. You, you have all kinds of things, yeah. right? So you have, not only do you have <coughs> entire chapters lost, yeah. You have large sections lost. So Aisha, for instance, says that two-thirds two of chapter 33 of the Quran lost, gone. That was the goat that ate it, right? No, no, no. That was, that was that we, No, if you, if you want the goat, let me, let, me, let me quote it because it's actually a good way to, to, to kind of close, uh, close, this, close this section out. <laughs> uh, like but but Aisha said two-thirds of Surah 33, yeah. which, is, which is, you know, kind of a mid-range uh -huh. uh, surah. Yeah. But it should be much longer. It should be around 200 verses. It's, okay. it's not. It's about a third that size now. But then you have <coughs> individual verses being missing from the Quran. Right. So let me, let me uh, if you go to the Muslim sources, you'll read over and over again. There's supposed to be a verse of stoning in there, right? Right, it's not there. It's supposed to be the verse of stoning, not in there. It's in the law, but it's not in the Quran. It's supposed to be in the Quran, though. Yeah, yeah. And you have a verse, actually two verses of breastfeeding an adult mm -hmm. are supposed to be in there. One that was ten times, and then that was abrogated to five times. Yeah. 
And so, but both of those are supposed to be in there. They're both listed in the Hadith as verses that are supposed to be in the Quran. You don't find either one of them. Breastfeeding an adult. The idea was, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you're a man, you have to work with a woman, and you don't want to risk being sexually attracted to her, well, she's got to breastfeed you five or ten times. And then your family. Yeah, and then your family, and you won't be sexually attracted to her, right? That works. Not surprised yeah. that this didn't end up in the Quran. Someone smarter came along and, took, and realized how ridiculous that is. Wait, you women are going to put your breasts in a dude's face and have him suck on them, and that's going to cut down the sexual tension? Uh, someone is living in a fantasy land. Let's, let's uh, close out this section with this verse. Okay. Uh, in fact, I want to read one more verse after this. We'll, we'll, I'll be quick. Sunan Ibn Majah, 1944. It was narrated that Aisha said, the verse of stoning and of breastfeeding an adult ten times was revealed, and the paper was with me under my pillow. Well, so the verses were revealed. Yeah. Aisha had the written version okay. under her pillow. When the messenger of Allah died, we were preoccupied with his death, and a tame sheep came in and ate it. Mm. Tame sheep came in and ate it. And just to summarize, I won't even, I won't even, I won't even give my own summary. <coughs> I will quote Abu Ubay, who's quoting Ibn Umar, one of Muhammad's companions, one of the rightly, uh, 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 the son of one of the rightly guided caliphs. Right. Ibn Umar says, he's telling people who later, years later, were claiming, I memorized the entire Quran. Mm -hmm. Watch what he says. So I'm saying. Let none of you say, I have learned the whole of the Quran. For how does he know what the whole of it is when much of it has disappeared? Let him rather say, I have learned what remains thereof. Well, there you go. Thank you, uh, Brother and David. Muslims will look at this. Well, it's all wrong. Our entire history is wrong. All of Muhammad's <laughs> companions are wrong. Every single source you go to on the history of the Quran is wrong because my leader at the mosque, he said the, he said the Quran's been perfectly preserved, and he's right. So modern Muslims' belief is two feet firmly planted in midair. No foundation, completely reject all that was there before. You're sticking your heads in the sand, Muslims. It's time to wake up and smell the roses. And in your case, the roses don't smell so good. Come to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to do in the second half of our program, look at the preservation of the Bible. And amazingly, Muslims, you might be rather surprised to find out that there's more proof for the preservation of the Bible in the Quran and Islam than there is for the preservation of Islam in the Quran. There sure is. <laughs> Let's take a break, and we'll be right back with more Jesus or Muhammad. Hello, this is Sam Shamoon from the Jesus or Muhammad show, one half of the team with David Wood. I'm here exhorting my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ who've been blessed by the programs at ABN, especially by the Jesus or Muhammad show, to consider and prayerfully consider to partner with us financially because as you know, ABN is a viewer supported satellite station. In order for us to continue to broadcast the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to Christians, but also to Muslims, and not just to Muslims, but to those who are sitting on the fence and are considering embracing a, a worldview or seeking after God. ABN wants to reach these people, but can only do so with your financial support. So I'm encouraging my brothers and sisters to come alongside ABN and make a financial contribution to continue Jesus and Muhammad and other shows with the purpose of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, seeing Christians get strengthened in their faith, Muslims coming to saving faith in Jesus, and others turning to Christ as their only hope and Savior. But again, we cannot do this if the support does not come in to continue to broadcast these shows. So would you please consider prayerfully asking God whether He'd have you support us on a regular basis so that we continue these programs and continue to bless the people of God, preach the truth of the gospel to the non-Christians, including Muslims, so that in everything we say and do that Jesus Christ will be glorified and that His gospel will spread throughout the entire world. Would you please join us financially? Thank you so much.
Summit. I'm Pastor Joseph, and I'm here with David Wood. We don't have much time left in our program, but what we want to do now is uh, shift to Shabir's statements about the Bible, that while the Quran certainly has been preserved, that's the implication of the question, obviously the Bible and previous scriptures weren't. Uh, for time's sake, I'm going to go right now to David for an introduction of that, and then we're going to watch that second clip, right? Yeah, so <clears throat> Muslims generally believe, and so here you have, once again, this, this tremendous difference between what the evidence actually says and what Muslims actually believe. Uh, we've seen in the last section that Muslims believe, any Muslim you talk to believes that the Bible has been corrupted and believes that the Quran has been perfectly preserved. We looked at the belief that the, the Quran has been perfectly preserved and it's absolute nonsense, not according to us, not according to textual critics. And by the way, it is, just so you know, it is. <laughs> It, it, it has gone through changes according to us, <laughs> and it has gone through changes according to textual critics. But we're saying you Muslims don't necessarily believe us, and any textual critic who, who tells you the Quran's been changed, is, you're going to say he's a liar and believe he's an evil. Believe your own yeah, Muslim yeah, sources. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what do we do? We quote Aisha. <laughs> we quote Sahih al-Bukhari. Uba ibn Kab. We quote Ibn Umar. We quote people that you should listen to. And what are you going to do now? Because it's not us saying the Quran has gone through changes. It's people like Aisha. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to say Aisha is a liar when she says that the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times and the verse of stoning, uh, they were eaten by uh, a sheep, and that's why we don't have them anymore? Or, or, is that what you're going to say? Especially because when then, they're in the Sharia. Because then, then you're telling me that evidence doesn't matter. You're just going to believe whatever makes you feel good about your religion. And when all of your sources say you're totally wrong, well, so much for all of your sources. Hmm. Well, great then. Don't tell me you know anything about Muhammad. Don't tell me you know anything about the history of Islam because those same sources that you would quote to tell me about Muhammad and early Islam are the same, course, co are the same sources that tell me the, the Quran has been corrupted. Right? So that's what you have when it comes to the Quran. Notice, Muslims believe perfect preservation right down to the letter. What does the evidence show? Entire chapters coming up missing, large sections coming up missing, verses coming up missing. Big, massive problems, according to the early, early Muslim community. And here we see the flip side. Your average Muslim believes that the Bible has been corrupted. It was corrupted by the Apostle Paul. It was corrupted at the Council of Nicaea. It was corrupted here. It was corrupted there. Everyone corrupted it. And it's not just the Bible, but all previous scriptures, all scriptures prior to the Quran. They're all corrupted. Yeah. And we're going to see that in the clip here. And here, Muslims just seem to have no clue what their book says, what their own book says. So, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's take a look at what Shabir says. Yeah, let's look at that clip right now. Why not the previous books then? Well, in the case of the previous books, God was sending book after another. God was sending prophet after another. So that if the message of the previous prophet was changed over time, that was not so much of a great issue because another prophet came to restore the message and bring it back to its pristine purity. So whereas, for example, some previous messages were, were uh, confused by people, Jesus came and restored it and he preached again. This is the word of God for you. Uh, so. After him, now, if the message becomes diluted again, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, comes and he restores the message and he puts it in its final form. Now it cannot be diluted because if it's diluted, people will be left without the guidance. Right. This is why God has undertaken to preserve the Quran, though he hasn't done so with the previous book. Shame on you, Shabir. Shame, shame, shame. He's not a good Muslim. Surah 3, verse 84. O Prophet, say, we believe in Allah and what is revealed to us and what was revealed. That means the previous scriptures, right? To Abraham, Ishmael, Ishaq, Yaqub, and their descendants. And in that which was given, that would be the scripture, to Moses. And that which was given to Jesus and other prophets from thereof. We do not discriminate any one of them. And to Allah do we submit in Islam. How does what Shabir Ali just said match up with that? I mean, that's completely disobeying this command, is it not? Yeah, so there's, so there's, there's definitely a difference. And I'm going to go yeah. ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and allow him to make that. Well, there is a massive difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Even though he's wrong, according to the Quran. Yeah, G well, I mean, he, he could defend it and say, well, that's not we do. When we say there's no distinction, we mean, you know, in the sense of how great they are or something like but that. But it says what was revealed to them. But go ahead. Yeah, but what, I, no, I notice wrong. what was revealed. And this brings us perfectly into the issue, right? Mm. Um, what was revealed. Yeah. 
What was revealed to them, we make no distinction. What was revealed. And yes, so in its original form, we make no distinction. The Bible lined up with the Quran perfectly. Right. right. So what your average Muslim believes, and what I'm sure Shabir believes, is that the Quran affirms the inspiration of the Christian and Jewish scriptures. Initially. But not yeah. the preservation and authority. Yeah, right. Not the preservation and authority. <coughs> and the problem is, if you actually read the Quran, you'll see that the Quran affirms not only the inspiration, but also the preservation and the authority. But, and when this was written, though, of course, when this was written in 7th century Arabia, it's talking about right now we affirm that there are no differences. And well, we have the Bible well, no, text no, no. from what, that time. What, what I'm saying is if we yeah. just went with that text, yeah. you could gotcha. say, well, what it means. What, if you just went with that text, you could say, well, what that means is when you bring that in line with what the rest of the Quran says, it's very clear. Yeah. That yes, gotcha. yes, you do, have, you do have the present scriptures. You do have yeah. the script. The at Christians do have the word of God Yeah, at that, at that time. time. So let's look at this. So why would a Muslim have to, have to <coughs> affirm the inspiration of Scripture. In other words, why don't Muslims just say the Quran is the only inspired book and who cares about any other book? <coughs> the Quran is the only inspired book, right? In other words, if, uh, you know, if some Buddhist comes with me with a, you know, a quotation from the Tripitaka or something like that, I'm going to say, so what? I don't believe in that. Why don't Muslims do that with all other Scriptures? Well, there's a reason. Their prophet doesn't allow them to. Their prophet doesn't allow them to do that. So, Surah 3, verses 3 through 4. He, Allah, he has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. So Allah revealed the Torah and the gospel and the Quran. That's why a Muslim can't say, I don't care, I don't care what right. the Torah or the gospel says. They're said. stuck. Yeah, they're stuck with the Torah and the gospel being inspired. But most Muslims want to stop there. Yes, we believe inspired. But we believe it's been corrupted, and that's why, uh, that's why, why Islam asked the question of Shabir in the first place. Why didn't Allah preserve those previous scriptures? And why do they believe that they're not the same very quickly, for anyone who's doubting? Well, the reason Muslims don't believe that the Christian scriptures are the authoritative word of God is that the Christian scriptures don't line up with Islam at all, right? Exactly. According to the Christian scriptures, Jesus, the divine son of God, who died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead. Islam denies all of that. So... Obviously, the Bible must have been corrupted. And at the, at the same time, in a, further, in a later show with Shabir Ali, we're going to say that at the same time, oh, no, it, actually the scriptures don't say he rose from the dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, yeah. Um, so, so notice the Muslim reasoning, right? Yeah, yeah. The Quran affirms the inspiration of the Christian scriptures. I open up the Christian scriptures. Up, oh, does it line up with Islam? Oh, okay, well, this has been corrupted. Obviously. Instead of saying Obviously. Muhammad was wrong, right? Right. Instead of saying what, they, what would be the obvious response, right? If I tell you, if I tell you, hey, I'm a prophet. You want to know that I'm a prophet? Go down to the river. There's a big billboard down there that says, believe in David Wood. You walk down there, there's a big billboard that says, don't believe in David Wood, he's a liar. You say, oh, the sign's been corrupted. <laughs> what are you talking about? I told you what the sign said. I told you what it was going to say, and it doesn't say that, right? So I'm wrong. Right? Not the sign has changed. I'm wrong. <laughs> Similarly, when Muhammad says, Christians have the, the authoritative word of God, you're Muslim, sh you shouldn't open it up and say, oh, it doesn't say what Muhammad said it was going to say. <laughs> oh, it's been corrupted. It's been changed. Your response should be, Muhammad was wrong. He didn't know what he's talking about. Can't be a prophet. I'm not going to trust him with my salvation. Right? So most Muslims want to accept the preservation, I mean, the, the, the inspiration part. The initial inspiration <laughs> of the Bible. Yeah. And deny the preservation and authority. The problem is, Surah 3, verses 3 and 4, are not all that the Quran says. <laughs> the Quran says more, ladies and gentlemen. Keep reading. Don't stop reading when you get to the part you like. Let's read <coughs> a few more verses, shall we? Mm -hmm. Please. Surah 7, verse 157, refers to those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures in the law and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. Now, this is talking about Christians and Jews during Muhammad's time. Mm -hmm. And it says about these Christians and Jews living in Muhammad's time, we find Muhammad mentioned in our scriptures in the law and the gospel. Mm -hmm. How are we finding Muhammad in the law and the gospel when we don't have the law and the gospel anymore? They've been corrupted, right? Yeah. Now, a Muslim will want to say, oh, yes, maybe you can still find some mentions of Muhammad, despite the fact that your book has been corrupted. Think about what sense this makes, ladies and gentlemen. Surah 10, verse 94, Muhammad was having doubts 
Muhammad was having doubts about his revelations. Love this verse. Everyone should learn this verse. If you had a top ten list of Quran verses you need to learn the references for, this is one of them. It's the most important verse in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. Surah 10, verse 94. This is talking to Muhammad. It says, but if you are in doubt, but the you there is singular. When you have the singular you, it's Allah talking to Muhammad. It says, but if you, Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. Now, only two possibilities here. Either we still have the preserved word of God, or we have a corrupt book. Well, in the time of Muhammad, it's clear they had to have this. Now, th now think about this, because there's only two, there's only, there's only two, you only, there are only two views. Either our book's been corrupted or it's not been corrupted, right? Mm -hmm. Either we have it, or either we have the preserved authoritative word of God or we don't, right? right. It's one or the other. Right. Allah tells Muhammad, Muhammad, you're doubting these revelations, go ask the people who are reading the book. So there's people during Muhammad's time that he could go to and ask about them reading the book. Right. Only two possibilities here. Either they had the book and yes. it hadn't been corrupted, right. in which case Muhammad is wrong because their uncorrupted book doesn't line up with Islam. Right. Or their book has been corrupted and Allah is telling Muhammad to confirm his message with, an, uh, with a corrupted book. Right. Why would Allah say, go to, go to the people who have been reading this corrupt book <coughs> filled with nonsense about Jesus dying on the cross for sins and see if your revelation lines up with it so you can know that it's true. Either way, either way, whether you believe it's preserved or whether you believe it's corrupted, doesn't match up with this doesn't match up with Islam you're in trouble but we can keep going we can keep going well, let's do that for Muslims who want to say ah Torah has been corrupted gospels been corrupted I wish you would read what the Quran says about people being able to corrupt Allah's words let me read to you Surah 18 verse 27 Allah says and recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. There is none who can alter his words. Pastor Joseph, who can corrupt Allah's word according to the Quran? Uh, that would be none. That would be zero. Uh, but the Apostle Paul can, right? It says the, but, but except, no one except the Apostle Paul can corrupt his words, I'm right? pretty sure none and it means none. No one except the Council ah, of Nicaea. None means a none. A Catholic <laughs> yes, none. Long yes. ago, corrupted the Bible. Ah. It's got to. It's got to. <laughs> but think about this. Think about this. Um, the Quran says none can, none can alter his words. Every right. Muslim will tell you the Bible's been corrupted. Yes, yeah. it was inspired, but it's been corrupted. Mm -hmm. And here, they'll reconcile this by saying, ah, oh, it's just the Quran. It only applies to the Quran. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it only applies to the Quran. Somehow, Allah gained the ability. That seems to be Shabir's position. Uh, it's only talking about the Quran. Well, that's not what it says. It doesn't say there is none who can alter the Quran. It says there's none who can alter his words. But if we take Shabir's argument seriously, Allah's word has been corrupted thousands of times in the past, right? Every prophet who comes along, even if he's only preaching and not, not delivering a book, his message was corrupted. They needed 123,999 prophets to get it right before the 124,000th Muhammad came. And by the way, where are the revelations of the 123,900 and whatever, 70 that the Quran doesn't mention? We don't even have them. They've all been corrupted. Now think about oh, this. Oh, they flew out. Pastor Joseph, can you name me any author in history whose words have been corrupted more than Allah's, according to what Shabir is telling me. <laughs> Allah's word has been corrupted far more than Shakespeare, far yeah. more than Homer, far more than anyone you could think of. Allah has gone through more, has seen more corruption of his word than anyone else in history. And here in the Quran, Allah's boasting, yeah. no one can alter my words. Wait a minute, you're <laughs> the worst in history, Allah, according to what Shabir Ali is telling me. You are the absolute worst at preserving your word. You're worse than anyone else. That's the whole purpose that we need more prophets, is yeah. because every previous message It keeps getting corrupted, so he keeps corrupt. sending them and sending yeah, them and sending ridiculous. them and sending them and sending them because they keep getting, getting corrupted. Yeah. And then Allah, no one can corrupt my word. What, what, do, you, what do you mean? It's happened thousands of times, more than anyone could ever write, and, and it's all been corrupted. Wow. Interesting stuff. Sounds but like we, it's time for a new prophet, yeah, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. This verse is actually very good theology, mm -hmm. right? I don't, I don't disagree with everything the Quran says. I don't believe the Quran is from God, but the Quran gets some things right. Like so, certain, when it says Jesus performed miracles, I, 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 I agree. Yeah. Um, when it says nothing is impossible for God or something like that, I, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. 
when I go to a, a verse like this, and it says, there's none who can alter his words. You know what I think? I think that's good theology. You can't stop God. Right. God wants something done. You can't stop him. Should be he's true. Not gonna, he's not going to, he's not going to, according to Surah 3, 3, and 4, we saw that according to the Quran, Allah gave the Torah and the Injil as a guidance. Well, what happened? It was corrupted. Who's it guiding? No one. So Allah wanted to do something. He tried really hard, but he just couldn't do it. Man overpowered him, right? That's what you believe about God? Well, that's not what this verse is telling me. This verse is telling me the reason man can't corrupt his word is Allah is too powerful. Right? I look at that and I say, wow. And then Muslims come along right behind it and say, he wasn't powerful enough to, <laughs> to protect any of his previous books. He just couldn't right. do it. He couldn't right. do it. All based on the fact that it doesn't agree. However, Brother David, this is their official position as apologists. But when you get into debate, isn't it interesting how Shabir and Zakhar Naik and the others, they're very quick to, to give to certain parts of the scripture inspiration and authority yeah. which mm -hmm. seem to bastion and strengthen and undergird their case. Mm -hmm. But obviously those parts that don't, ah, that's the part that's been mm -hmm. corrupted. Absolutely. So some has and some hasn't. And the only way we know is whatever agrees with Islam. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So Muslims want to believe inspiration of Christian scriptures, but not preservation. <laughs> and we just looked and we saw people were reading the book in Muhammad's time because he tells them you can find me mentioned in, your, in the Torah and the Gospel. So they had the Torah and the Gospel. Read the yeah. book that is between your hands. Mm -hmm. Sam makes a big deal mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. yeah. So they have the Torah and the Gospel. If they have the Torah and the Gospel, obviously, unless Allah is referring to a corrupted Torah and Gospel, mm -hmm. then, Which wouldn't then make any problem. sense. Yeah. And then Muhammad himself is told, you go to the people who have been reading the book. How they, what, the corrupt book? <laughs> They've been reading the corrupt book? If so, why is Muhammad going to them for, for confirmation? Why aren't you Muslims coming to us for confirmation from our corrupt book? Yeah. Asking us, hey, does, does our revelation line up with your corrupt book? Because if not, then our revelation is false. What are you talking about? This doesn't even make sense. And finally, the Quran, according to the Quran, no one can corrupt Allah's words. So has it been preserved? Of course it has. Of course it has been preserved if no one can corrupt Allah's words. Right. And you want to reinterpret what Allah says because you don't like what Allah says. The Quran is making a very clear claim about Allah's great power. No one can, no one can stop him. And the Quran says Allah gave the Torah and the gospel as a guidance you say has been corrupted. So Allah couldn't protect his word. Nice. Uh, now let's read two more verses because we've seen inspiration and preservation. Let's right. talk about authority. Gotcha. Is the Bible still authoritative? Well, according to the Quran, for people who follow Jesus, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely, no question about it. Let me read two verses. Surah 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel, that's Christians. Mm -hmm. So just a few verses earlier, it was, talking, it was talking about Jews. It told the Jews that they need to judge by the Torah. Right. Now, how can Jews judge by the Torah if they don't have the Torah anymore? The Torah has been corrupted. Right. And then you get to Surah 5, verse 47. Talks, so notice what it does. It talks to Jews, talks to Christians, and then verse 48, it talks to Muslims. And it tells Muslims they judge by the Quran. Mm -hmm. So Surah 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Mm. If any fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, and it's talking about the gospel in this context. They're no better right. than those who rebel. So, Shabir Ali, you Christians, don't judge by the gospel. The gospel has been corrupted. Allah didn't preserve it because he was going to send more people, and he only actually preserved the Quran. Don't believe the gospel. I open up the Quran. If I do not judge by what's in the gospel, I am no better than a rebel. I'm going to hell if I do what Shabir Ali tells me. Shabir yeah. Ali is telling me something that, according to the Quran, will get me sent to hell. Right. Allah says... Judge by the gospel, you Christians. Shabir Ali says, whatever you do, don't judge by the gospel. It's been corrupted. And make it clear to those Muslims out there who are ignorant about this fact, we have the biblical text, actual physical text, from the time before Muhammad, the time Muhammad lived on the earth, and the time after Muhammad, and they do not differ in any significant way from the Bible we have right now. Correct. So... If, in, in other words, if he's affirming the authority of the gospel, That's during, Muhammad's, the time, authority of during Muhammad's time, we have it. We right have here. It. We've got it. Amen. We've got it. Amen. So that's Surah 5, verse 47. Contrary to what Muslims tell us, you Christians judge by the gospel. And if you, if, again, if you read this passage in context, it tells the Jews, you Jews, you judge by the Torah. And if they didn't have it in their time, that would make absolutely no sense. Because yeah. you couldn't oh, yeah. judge or, or, by or, something or it's corrupted. been corrupted, right? 
So, Airtight case. Yeah. So in other words, if a Muslim wants to say, oh, yeah, but you still have some truth in the Bible. Well, I believe there's some truth in the Quran. I would never tell someone, judge by the Quran, because it contains some truth and a lot of falsehood. Right? Similarly, why would Allah say, you Christians, judge by your corrupted book, which contains all sorts of false beliefs about Jesus? Would Allah tell me that? Is God going to tell me to, to go and, and do that? And say that I'm a rebel if I don't, if I don't obey him? And so what you have is the Quran tells Jews, Jews, you go judge by your book. That only makes sense if they have their book. Right. And it says, Christians, you judge by your book. That only makes sense if Christians have their book. And then verse 48 tells Muslims, you judge by the Quran. That only makes sense. That only makes sense if there are these three books. They're all inspired. They're all preserved. They're all authoritative from the Muslim perspective. <laughs> and 1094, hey, Muhammad, if you're having trouble figuring out what we're telling you, you go to the Christian and Jews who are reading the Bible, and they'll help you out, buddy. All right. <laughs> One last verse. Surah 5, verse 68. Surah 5, verse 68. Say, this is what? Muhammad is supposed to say to the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, say, O people of the book, ye have no ground to stand upon unless ye stand fast by the law, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. What's that? You stand fast just by the Quran? Hmm. No, Anjil and the, the Torah. The law and the gospel. The Bible. You have to stand upon them. You have no ground to stand upon if you don't. Now, assuming our text has been corrupted, why would Allah say, you have no ground to stand upon if you don't stand upon that corrupted book? What sense does that make? And the answer is, it makes absolutely no sense. So, once again, Muslims tell us something. They tell us what they believe. We believe the Bible's been corrupted. Why? Well, Shabir, could you explain to us why the Bible's been corrupted? Why didn't Allah... Why didn't Allah protect his word? Shabir, oh, because Allah didn't need to protect his word, and blah, blah, blah. We open up the Quran. Torah and the gospel are inspired. Torah and the gospel are preserved. They were still available in Muhammad's time, and no one can corrupt Allah's word. And they're authoritative for Christians and Jews. Very different message we get from the Quran and what we see Shabir saying. So my, my question for Muslims out there is, who should we believe? Should we believe Shabir? Or should we believe the Quran Allah? And if we, yeah, if we go with Allah, if we say we believe Allah, then we have to say Islam is false because Allah tells us to go to our book and to judge by our book. I look in my book, your book doesn't line up, your book is false. Brother David, we're out of time, but, but you know, if I was a Muslim, as for me in my house, I'd follow Allah instead of Shabir. Jesus or Muhammad, hey, we'll be right back next week with another show. God bless you all and good night.